frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. I'm going to make him an offer he can't refuse. As far back as I can remember, I always wanted to be a gangster. Don't you understand, George? It's because you were not born. Film church. Well, a, a boy's best friend is his mother. One morning, over at Elizabeth's beach house, she asked me if I'd rather go water skiing or lay out. And I realized that not only did I not want to answer that question, but I never wanted to answer another water sports question or see any of these people again for the rest of my life. Hello, and welcome to Film Church Radio. This is the podcast that treats cinema as a religion. It's Sunday. I'm Brandon. I'm Lewis. And we are here to talk about movies. Each week, Lewis and I alternate picking a film for both of us to watch and discuss. And today, I picked the film Bottle Rocket from 1996, directed by Wes Anderson, starring all of the Wilsons you could ever dream of. <laughs> Owen Wilson, Luke Wilson, Andrew Wilson. Uh, and then we also have Robert Musgrave, James Caan, loads of other actors and actresses sprinkled throughout as well. Um, this is Wes Anderson's direct toral debut, uh, and also the debut of the Wilson gang, mm. um, you know, put upon the world. Uh, it's a lot of fun. You can see a lot of Wes Anderson's signature style already in this. And, um, yeah, I, I like the movie a lot. We're going to get into it here in a little while, but first... I have to say, thank you <laughs> to all of our listeners. Uh, it means the world to us that anybody's listening to our show. And thank you for all the love and kind words that everyone's been saying. Um, and if you're new to the show, welcome. Welcome to the congregation. Uh, please you know, like and subscribe, whatever podcast platform you're listening to us on. And you know, we always post on Sundays. That's a uh, our holy day of film discussion. Um, and if you really love the show, please share it with your friends. And you can find us on all the social media platforms at Film Church Radio. You can send us a comment on there, message, tell us what you think of the show. Um, Instagram, we've put out cool little clips of the episodes with, you know, clips of the movie. Um, so follow us on Instagram. And then on YouTube, we post extra content. Uh, and we're going to be posting more soon, more reviews of newer movies and video stuff. So be sure to follow us on YouTube. And uh, yeah, come hang with us in this film church. Um, before we get into the movie, Lewis and I always talk about what we've been watching this week. Um, so I'm going to pass it over to Lewis. How are you doing, Lewis? I'm good, my friend. How are you? Doing good, man. Good. What have you been watching? So I have been um, praying to two film gods this week in particular. Yeah. Um, as regular listeners of the show will have guessed, um, my Hitchcock obsession continues into this week. Um, another few knocked out. Um, so I watched Blackmail from 1929, um, credited as the first British talkie. Um, oh, interesting which is obviously directed by Hitchcock. And um, I mean, he does, you know, it's already incredible how self-assured he is yeah. with this new medium. I mean, there's a very famous scene in particular where our lead actress, well, our lead character has um, stabbed a man in a previous scene who was um, trying to assault her. Um, and she's at the kitchen table and... Or, and someone's kind of describing the murder at the kitchen table. Uh -huh. And the audio kind of like fades out apart from the word knife. And she like flinches every time it's said. And I'm like, to say this is like the early days of sound, that is such a cool technique. You know, it's yeah. not like a flawless technique, but it is, it's, he's already playing around with it. Yeah. You know, um, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, if I, if I'm remembering my film history correctly. Uh, mm. Is this was this film when it's when they started shooting it going to be silent? Yeah, and then in the production they decided to add sound. Yeah, so it was pretty much halfway through, um, and he had to kind of go back and shoot 
particular scenes. Ah. Um, so the opening five to ten minutes is silent. Um, and then characters start talking. Yeah. And the lead actress, Annie Ondra, was um, Czechoslovakian. Um, and she had a very thick accent. Yeah. So just like in Singing of the Rain, they had someone at the side of the stage like dubbing her lines. Wow. Um, yeah. I mean, it's it's in, it's one of those um, films that I'm just so happy has like stood the test of time. It's still here. It's not been lost. You know, yeah. it's an incredible um, thing to kind of witness. And there's a great um, clip on YouTube of him kind of like testing the sound with the lead actress Annie Ondra. It's about 40 seconds long, um, but it's great yeah. just to see him in like the 20s kind of, you know, playing with this medium and stuff. It's awesome. Um, and then we watched Strangers on a Train, one of my favorites. Oh, yeah. You know, I love that film. Mm-hmm. You love that film. It's the um, best. Yeah, it's just, it's such a good thriller. You know, it's, there's yeah. so many little touches in there that make it enjoyable. And um, I just love being in that film. It's, you know, I've watched it a few times, so. Yeah, um, it's always good to go back, and then the other film god that I've been spending my time with is Kazan. Um, mm-hmm. I have been wanting to go back and watch some of his films since we talked about Facing the Crowd, um, yeah. which we both absolutely loved. Yeah, so um, I watched On the Waterfront, mm-hmm. um, which I really enjoyed. Thought it was great, um, and then I watched Streetcar Named Desire, yeah. which um, holds a special place because I I studied. Streetcar Named Desire at school. Yeah. Um, and my mom, knowing I was into film, because she worked at a library, got this for me from the library so that I could kind of watch the film and I think, I guess, be more interested in the play. Uh, okay. um, but obviously the film is what <laughs> I yeah. gravitated towards, you know. Um, but the performances, I mean, Vivian Lee and Marlon Brando are just unbelievable. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. so great. Um and that yeah i mean as a double bell they work really well yeah so and i uh, mean you had seen on the waterfront before right i had i'd seen it yeah. when i was at school and i don't think i like I, I don't think i enjoyed it as much as i did this time yeah um yeah i feel I like it. that's probably the same same for me even watching i mean i liked streetcar named desire the first time i saw it but mm. uh I, I feel like a lot of a lot of it went over my head maybe the first time I saw it and it's been a, it's been a while so I need to revisit it and I love Brando and Kazan so mm. I'm going to I'm going to have to do that soon. Yeah, what surprised me was I found on the wall from very emotion like emotionally charged this time. Mm. Yeah. You know, I thought I found it very moving which um I didn't think I would, you know. It, you, yeah. I didn't go in being like okay, I'm going to be moved in this film. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Um but yeah, they're both really good. Um and then showed my daughter Toy Story three. Nice. Um, she saw me cry. So <laughs> that was that was fun. You know, big ugly tears. Did she comfort um, you? Not really. She just said, "You like Buzz," and I said, "I guess." <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, Toy Story four is next, but I don't like that as much. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and then to round it off, um. There's there's a film that I watched and I've I've watched it a lot. I wrote about it at school and um and I it's just one of those films that I can't believe isn't talked about more. You uh-huh. know, and I like I go back to it and I'm like, this is incredible. This like I love everything about it. Um and it's The Man with the Golden Arm from nineteen fifty five. Yeah. Um, directed by Otto Preminger, um, who did a few really good film noirs amongst some other Kind of, did you? We talked about this a little bit, didn't we? Did you text me I about this so. or something? At, at, at some point, probably I talk about this film a lot. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, um, <clears throat> and it play and it stars Frank Sinatra as a recovering drug addict who's trying to go straight, and like there's just temptation everywhere, and there's like in this um, abusive marriage, and it's just I I can't describe it in like well enough. Um, it's such an interesting film um, yeah. and one that I think people should definitely try and track down if you haven't seen it. I mean, just to see Frank Sinatra act is, is great, but to see him play a recovering drug addict is even better, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's really good. It's got a really good soundtrack too. 
Sweet. And I was going to pick it when we did Rebecca, but I think I like I was just I was so into Hitchcock at that point. Mm-hmm. That was yeah. like, it's got to be a Hitchcock film, you know. Yeah. Um. So I went back and watched it on my own. And I was just like, it's it's brilliant. Yeah. So expect that at some point in the future. <laughs> Sweet. I'm gonna have to add it to my watch list, or just I don't know. Wait for you to be like, it's time. Yeah. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> and what have you been watching, dude? So a few things. I watched um, the original Mission Impossible from 96. Mm. You know, Tom Cruise, Brian De Palma. And it's weird because I feel like I watched this film not too long ago. Uh, you know, rewatched it not too long ago. But but rewatching it this time, I I feel like I thought it was a different movie or something. Because rewatching yeah. it this time, it brought back... Uh, some nostalgic memories that I had forgotten about, oh, wow. which is really cool that you know, yeah. film can do that. And I remember watching this film as a kid, you know, with my dad and probably some of my other family members. Um, but just you know, it just took me right back to remembering experiencing this film as a kid, and That's just cool. how fun it was. And yeah. like how cool, like it's it doesn't hold up that well as I mean, especially compared to the other Mission Impossible movies now, um, because it's you know while they there is still a lot of practical effects and stuff like the whole helicopter and the train scene at the end yeah. is uh, you know it doesn't look that great. I no. you know I yeah. guess it you know you can tell it's like green screen or projection or something like that um but it's still you know because I watched it as a kid was just so fun to like it just takes me right back to that place it's kind of weird you yeah. know what I mean how it can just like bring up what what it felt like to be a kid watching that movie like uh yeah the whole like the gu- the stick of gum with the red and the green and him like him smashing it and like sticking it on the helicopter and stuff was it's it was just weird to be like oh yeah I remember watching mm-hmm. this yeah um so it was a lot of fun and I'm gonna I'm gonna probably do a rewatch of all the Mission Impossible's now uh, yeah. to get it's... get ready for the new one because yeah go ahead I was just gonna say I feel like when we do a rewatch we always start with three. Because mm, yeah, I mean Philip Seymour Hoffman's in it, and it's kind of like the start of the of the the new better ones, yeah, the more yeah. modern, updated effects, and yeah. yeah, and I think that's that's harsh because I think it's just number two that we don't like, yeah, that much. But I don't want to kind of I don't know. We always start with three, so I don't feel like I've seen the first one enough, and yeah. I always forget it's De Palma. Mm-hmm, yeah, it, it blows my mind. Yes, yeah, crazy. <laughs> yeah. um... Yeah, I remember like it, when I decided to rewatch it, I I was like, I think the last time I watched this, I didn't understand what was going on, and then watching it this time, I was like, how come I didn't understand what was going on? Yeah, like, it's pretty, pretty basic, simple mm. to follow. Like it's not overly complicated, but but then again, like I I couldn't tell you what any of the other movies were about either. <laughs> I don't think you, you you definitely like you can't. It's like James I, Bond. I know. It's like the, it doesn't yeah. really matter. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I know I do remember that the second one because I guess I watched that a lot as a kid too. Is about uh like a uh, virus because like mm. I remember like the girl injecting it at the end and stuff and being like, "I am the virus now and I'm worth <laughs> millions of dollars." And <laughs> <laughs> and I put in like, oh, I remember. Okay, the, now I'm just going on a tangent of things I remember about Mission Impossible Two, which everyone hates. <laughs> <laughs> at the end when he's on the he's like on the beach and the yeah. the he like looks down and like there's a gun in the sand and he like kicks his foot up and he like spins around and grabs a gun to shoot the guy. Um <laughs> I ended up putting that in one of my movies. Uh, but the character oh, like cool. before he does that before he kicks up the gun, he says Mission Impossible 2. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> so yeah, I guess the first two actually do hold kind of a special place in my heart. Um, yeah. but it's not plagiarism if it's parody. Exactly. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, after that, well, I mean, I talked about this last week. I you watched The Freshman, but I hadn't finished it. So I did finish The Freshman <laughs> with uh, Matthew Broderick and Marlon Brando, yeah. and it's, <laughs> you know, it's 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 it just is. <laughs> yeah, you sent me a, a clip of some of the sparkling dialogue between the yeah. two, um, and I was watching it on the waterfront at that point, <laughs> and, I, <laughs> and I was like. Oh dear! <laughs> yeah, I don't want to. Rem- I don't want to think about old Brando. <laughs> yeah, it's weird, man. It's a it's a weird watch, and you know, I mean, Marlon Brando and Matthew Broderick—they're both good actors, and yeah. like at the end of that clip I sent you, it's it's like Matthew Broderick kind of sums up the movie with his dialogue at the end, <laughs> and he's just like, "Well, you know, it just was." Yeah, <laughs> he's like trying to describe their relationship. Um. <laughs> And then I, so, you know, we watched Bottle Rocket, which we're about to get to. Yeah. Uh, but um, I just started looking around at like stuff that Owen Wilson has done and kind of like where his career was going after that and mm. uh, stumbled upon this thing called Heat Vision and Jack uh, from 1999, directed by Ben Stiller, starring, oh, wow. starring Jack Black. And Owen Wilson in 1999, and Ben Stiller's uh, wife. I guess she's his ex-wife now. I can't uh, remember her name. Mm. Sorry, female representation. Um, <laughs> and uh, it's it's only 30 minutes. You can find it on YouTube. It apparently never aired, uh, oh, wow. and it is the corniest, cheesiest crap you're ever gonna watch <laughs> but it is it's really i mean it's short it's 30 minutes long if you like jack yeah. black you know it's really funny um but it's it's jack black and he he rides this motorcycle called heat vision uh and it's alive and it's voiced by owen wilson <laughs> and uh i'm currently working on a script where i have a talking vehicle and after watching this, I was like, I'm changing the script. It's not going to be a talking vehicle. Because <laughs> yeah. it's like, there's no way to yeah. do this well, you know? Yeah. I mean, you know, I'm fine with corniness and cheesiness and comedy and stuff, but uh, it's just, it. I don't know that there's a way to do it and still take it seriously, you know? Yeah. And actually have like a heart. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, yeah I, I, I don't know. There probably is someone out there that can do it, but I, I think I'm going to steer away from that. No pun intended. Um, Whenever I think of talking vehicles, and I'm going to sound like a parody myself. Oh, there's a Simpsons bit where there's night boat instead of night rider. Uh, yeah. Um, and this boat's chasing these like bad guys and they get off the jet skis onto motorbikes. And they're like, oh no, they're getting away. And the night boat's like, don't worry, there's a canal. And it goes back to the family, and they're like, there's always a canal or a fjord or a lake. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. I didn't tell it very well. But it, I mean, talking vehicles are very hard to, I don't know, do with, I mean, they're yeah. very hard to do without it just being like campy. Yeah. Because I, I looked that up and I swear that. Like Jack Black has talked, to, I've seen him talk about this pilot. I mean, probably because like apparently, yeah. um, uh, Ben Stiller met his wife on this, you know, project, uh, and probably met Jack Black and Owen Wilson. Mm. I would imagine. I mean, maybe. I mean, th- I mean, it. I mean, nineteen ninety nine. This is only three years after Bottle Rocket. You yeah. know, and then you know, like. Ben Stiller and Jack Black and Owen Wilson would all go on to, you know, obviously yeah. and his wife too would all go on to do tons of stuff together. Yeah, so. and Owen Wilson would also voice another vehicle. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Bizarre. <laughs> it is very strange. Um, yeah. Uh, but also, I finished the oh. series finale of Better Call Saul. My Twitter has been in absolute meltdown over this. Yeah. Not that I've ever, I haven't watched any of it, unfortunately. Um, but just the amount of people that are like, it was the best show on TV. Bro, like, yeah. 
I cannot believe how good this show is and was yeah. and how good the finale was. Like it just it is absolutely mind boggling. Like if you're a fan of break like when when Breaking Bad finished and I heard that the and they announced like they're gonna do a prequel called Better Call Saul about Saul Goodman, who is his lawyer, I was just like, Why? That's gonna be so bad. Yeah. That's gonna like ruin the show and Yeah. You have no idea, man. <laughs> like it is so good. It it changes everything about um not everything, but uh, it changes a lot about what you think about Breaking Bad in a real yeah. in a in in a way that in a good way, like in a way that you just can't imagine. Because like wow. I I like Breaking Bad to me was the greatest show ever created, and I was like, don't touch it. You can't do you can't no. if you mess with it, you're gonna ruin it. And they did something that just like makes it even better. Wow. And yeah, Better Call Saul is just like. To me, it's like it's hard to say which is better. Like it's it's really hard. I I don't know if I can say which is better because to me, it's all it's all been Wong. the same show, yeah. kind of. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Because they um they flash forward to like obviously Better Call Saul is a prequel, but throughout the show, they're flashing forward to post Breaking Bad. Wow, timeline okay. so yeah you're getting bits and pieces of different stuff throughout the show and then at the end it all just like Come oh my that. god dude it's so freaking good yeah i've got to get on it i mean i i want to rewatch breaking bad i feel like every time someone talks about breaking bad yeah i'm like i've got to watch the whole thing right now yeah because you know, <laughs> i really like el camino as well yeah the yeah. Like, netflix film they did i thought that was mm-hmm. great so um, yeah, if you're listening to this and you haven't watched any of the like Breaking Bad universe or whatever, I would I would watch Breaking Bad, and then watch El Camino, and mm-hmm. then watch Better Call Saul. That is the way that it should be experienced. Sweet. It's Sweet. it's basically um, the way that they kind of c- created them, but I mean, yeah. El Camino technically came out in between seasons of Better Call Saul, but it's like. I think the way that it's intended to be consumed is like Breaking Bad, El Camino, Better Call Saul. Yeah, yeah. Wow, that's awesome. And Vince Gilligan's been like involved in it all. Oh yeah, yeah. That's sweet. Mm-hmm. I think I believe he directed the you know the uh, final episode as wow. well as several episodes throughout. You know, and mm-hmm. he's you know yeah he's been. I mean that's why it's so good. I mean Vince Gilligan yeah. is you know the the creator of it and everything. Obviously, there's like a bigger writing team and stuff too, but yeah, you know, he understands the, he's just such what a good writer. Yeah. yeah. Like he understands yeah. what he created and the characters. And, um, I think obviously like the fans also have a lot to do with it. Like the feedback they get as they're in yeah. between seasons and stuff and how much people love certain characters. Yeah. Um, yeah, man, you have no idea. <laughs> 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 it is amazing. Like, yeah, it is unbelievably good. Mm. Man, I'm gonna have to track it down. Um, talking of which, just real quick before we move on to the main feature, okay. have you been watching the rehearsal? I've only watched the first episode so far. Oh my god, it's <laughs> so good. Have you finished it already? Um, so the last episode is on tomorrow night. Oh, okay, cool. So we've watched up to that point. Um, yeah. And I went back and watched the last season of Nathan for You. Okay. Because I just can't wait in between episodes. Yeah. Um, he's amazing. Yeah. The show's amazing. Yeah. That's. that's I it. I believe you. I'm. I mean, I'm. I've been really getting into Nathan for you, and then I watched the first episode yeah. of the rehearsal, and and yeah, and I've listened to a few interviews. Like he did an interview on the A twenty four podcast and stuff, and and yeah, his process and his humor and his yeah, he's just a mad genius. He is. He he really is, and it's just the. I mean, this isn't as much like comedy and awkwardness, even though there are really awkward bits. It's just how insane the show gets because after the first episode the first episode is is really good but after the first episode it becomes more like a long form yeah 
um, which I like a lot. Um, and then it just, I don't know, it's like Nathan for you, but it's being boiled down so much more. Do you know how you, he always goes like the one step further yeah. than you think? Mm-hmm. Um, this is like 20 steps past that. <laughs> It's just, cool. it's insane. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, it's like, you know, getting the idea of like the most insane thing you could do yeah. and then being like, well, I have to do it now. And it always starts. I mean, the thing that I think of the most, um, if you've never seen Nathan Few, it always starts with an idea. So he goes in to help like a bar in Nathan Few and his idea is to let them smoke in there. Yeah. But like to have them smoke, they must be a theater and putting on a performance yeah it, so he yeah. puts like a stage like a little seating area <laughs> yeah and has people pay to come and watch people drink and smoke in the bar yeah and then he's like actually maybe this is art so he has actors recreate that and then yeah. stages it. it's just like it just keeps going yeah exactly. and that's just on nathan for you that's like yeah it's incredible well i'm he's, gonna get right back on that show yeah as soon as yeah. Soon as we're done with this, <laughs> <laughs> do you want to pause for a couple of hours and then come back? Yeah, and then be like, "Oh, that's what you were talking about." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. Well, people, I think we're ready. Yeah. For the bottles of rockets. Yeah. It's bottle rocket from 1996. That was a terrible segue. Um, (laughs) IMDb summarizes this film as three friends plan to pull off a simple robbery and go on the run. I feel like maybe we should go to Letterboxd from now on for our our summaries. Yeah, I was kind of thinking that too. (laughs) Just getting pulled down. It's like next week it's just going to be like a film about people. (laughs) (laughs) A film with the subject matter. That's right. Yeah, Um, yeah, like I said at the beginning of the show, I enjoyed this film quite a lot. Uh, Yeah. It's really funny. Like, I I had watched uh, the Jarjeeling Limited a few weeks ago, and that kind of made me want to dive back into Wes Anderson. Mm -hmm. Um, And the Darjeeling Limited uh, was from like 2007 or something like that, I think. And it's, it's about three brothers also has Owen Wilson in it in a very similar role, kind of like, uh, you know, in, in this movie, he's kind of a, mm, I don't know the best way to describe him. He He's a very into his own, he's very in his own world. That's perfect. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and he's yeah. trying to get everybody on in his world and on his train. Um, yeah. And, uh, yeah, there's just something about Wes Anderson and his humor mm. that just, it's unlike anything else, and it just works. Yeah. You know, it's like, it's stuff that I could never think of. Like, I would never think, because on paper, like, this doesn't seem like it would be funny. Like, there seems like there'd be such a fine line with this type of comedy where it it would it could just be come off as like amateur yeah or just not funny you know what i mean but it just somehow works and i don't know if that's you know the combination of Wes Anderson and Owen Wilson and Luke Wilson and like their collaboration and you know or Wes Anderson's direction or or what but um this film is is great go check it out if you haven't seen it. it's on hbo max but it did have a long journey it's like it's one of those things that could have easily have never have happened and it and it's kind of crazy how far all of these guys have come you know when we're talking about you know this is 1996 and now we're in 2022 um and wes anderson is you know and been nominated for several Oscars. Uh, you know, he hasn't really won yet, but he's, you know, a very prestigious, successful filmmaker, very recognizable style and comedy, and people love him. Owen Wilson is, um, 
he's a part of our culture you know yeah. he, he's a he's an icon you know whether you think he's a good actor or not he is a cultural icon you know he's been in so many comedies so many like just he's just everywhere you know what i mean like everybody knows him everybody knows mm. his voice you know everybody knows his wow you know <laughs> like <laughs> um luke wilson is uh a little bit behind him, I would say. You know, he's he's not as well known, but like most people know who he is. You know, yeah, and he's then, got a recognizable face. Yeah, and then also in this film is Andrew Wilson, who, um, you know, I know I'm I'm being long winded here, and I'll let Lewis talk here in a second. But uh, Andrew Wilson was in Idiocracy, which we watched a few weeks ago, as mm. the. Uh, what did they call him? Uh, Beef Supreme. He was the guy with the beard, you know, fighting <laughs> yeah. uh, with the trucks at the end. And then in this this film, he plays, um, uh, let's see, Robert Musgrave's older brother. So weirdly, weirdly in this movie, all the Wilsons are in it, but they're not playing brothers. Yeah, none um, of them related. And Andrew Wilson uh, plays an older brother in this film, and he's like the perfect douchebag. And yeah, I didn't even know it was him until yeah. I was reading the trivia, and I was like, "Wait a minute, that was him the whole time." <laughs> I was like, "Cause he was a really good character, and I thought he was yeah. hilarious." Um, but I think because he didn't have the beard, I just didn't recognize him. Cause he's also in a film called Whip It, uh, mm. that Drew Barrymore directed. Uh, yeah, and he plays like the the coach with um, Ellen Page. Well, Elliot Page. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so, you know, I had seen him a few times, so I just, he just looks so different without the beard. It was weird. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, so, you know, that was, that was a lot of, of stuff for me. What did, <laughs> you know, what were your initial thoughts and, and what did you, what'd you think? Yeah. Are you a little bit nervous this week? Seeing as Id um, Idiocracy, we were so polar opposite. Um, I don't I don't think I am because I feel okay. like this is uh I feel like you liked this movie. I'll just say that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I've never been a huge fan of Wes Anderson myself. Um well, I think we talked a little bit about it last week when um you'd watched um The Darjeeling Limited. Yeah. Um I I've, I've seen a few but I've not like sought them out, you yeah. know, in terms mm -hmm. of I don't I'm not sure why exactly yeah. maybe i think maybe he's too i don't think there's like a way in for me if that makes sense yeah he's well very we stylized and it's his film you yeah know? yeah we talked about that last week and i i feel like i've been the same way it's like yeah i've always i every time i come away from his film i'm like that was really good but i've never yeah. just it's never been enough for me to just dive into him and i don't know why because yeah i like all of his stuff yeah um but this really worked for me. I think yeah. the um as you were saying, the comedy is really good. I think there's a tenderness to it as well. There's like mm -hmm. a real um like l loving nature towards these characters. Um and you really kind of are pulling for them. Um it's not showy at all, I don't think. It's not like you know, you get up to the big I mean, there is a finale, but it's not like I don't it's not like other films. It's very low stakes and you know um i don't know it's just done really well um and it's just it's just really nice to see obviously like a group of friends with a little bit of money you know just being yeah. able to kind of make this film and do what they want with it yeah you know? um and i think where you were saying about like the style of comedy in this film i think where it stem stems from for me is just these characters are so lovingly handled. It's mm -hmm. not, we're never laughing at them. Yeah. You know, I mean, some of them, you know, some of the characters like Dignan, Owen Wilson's character will say something that's funny, but it's not like, look at him, he's funny. Right. It's more, it, I, don't, I don't know how to describe it. It's just, I, yeah, it's there, very. There's definitely like a charm to these characters yeah. because like, yeah. you know, Luke Wilson is 
is somebody that I don't really think of as charming as an actor. No. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? He's just kind of, uh, I don't think he's a bad actor, mm. but he's he's also not, you know, he's never stood out to me in, no. a, in any particular way, I guess. You know what I mean? Um, he's never felt out of place necessarily, but I've never had any kind of gravitation towards him. Whereas in this film, I mean, man, he's like charming as hell. Yeah. Like it's, yeah. it's, it's really interesting, you know, like even, uh, I mean, especially in the scenes with him and Inez, you know, when he falls yeah. in love with her and stuff. But even before that, like just thinking about like, you know, when you're saying like, you're not laughing at him, like the scene towards the beginning when he's like sitting with his little sister and she's like, she is kind of making fun of him in, in some ways, you know, she's like, uh, you know, you don't have a job and stuff. And yeah. Um, and just their whole like relationship is funny, but like you said, you're not really laughing at him, you yeah. know, and it's, and yeah. it's still, it's has this like charm to it. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I think it's it's just lovely to see like atypical heroes, the people we don't normally get to see on camera, being perf like embodied so well by the actors and treated so well by the director. Yeah, you know, I, I think that the fact that yeah, obviously Dignan is the is the kind of the odd one out in terms of the group. You know, yeah. he's the one that's a little bit more childlike in some respects um but the fact that they all are like with him you know and I, I just love the scene towards the end where he comes back for the like the final this is the final robbery like this is the the big one and um luke wilson's character is like and you can plan it you know just that really like, yeah and he gets all excited and it's just like you know it feels lived in and mm -hmm. it obviously works because they're brothers and yeah. there's that you know, they depend that like can lean on each other a little bit. Yeah. Um, but it, it's like it's like it, you can tell that it's a proper friendship. Yeah. That's yeah. coming out. You know. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, because there's some some genuine. Yeah. Love for each other there that just cut you know seeps into the the camera you know without yeah. that much effort. Yeah, I think they can just be a little bit more natural around each other. Yeah. Because they've already got that bond, you know. Yeah. Um, and that shows on the screen. Yeah. What's crazy to me about this film is that it didn't have success at all. No. Um, they they started with, which ho hopefully, like for any filmmakers out there, um, and for me as well, like it's like the story of the, how this got made and the story of Owen Wilson and the other Wilsons and Wes Anderson is, is very encouraging because they uh, made bottle rocket as a short film in 1992. Mm -hmm. And it took till 1996 for like the feature to get made and put out. And then it also wasn't successful, successful at all. And they still mm -hmm. went on to make another film and, and create success. Yeah. Um, but the, even the short film didn't do that great. Like it got into Sundance, but it yeah. it didn't win anything. And there was just one person, one of the judges at Sundance that was like, there really is something here. And then she got yeah. them in contact with, um, I forget who it was, like another producer and stuff to like help, help them turn it into a feature. Um, and then that was a whole long process. And then like they got James Caan, which is crazy. Yeah. And he's great in the film. You he know? is, yeah. Um, he's like imposing but friendly. You know, you never know. Like, there's that. There's certain scenes where I'm like, he's he's gonna kick the crap out of him. You know, yeah. like, <laughs> and then he doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> but there's just I don't know. I don't yeah, know it's to... gotta be. It, I mean, it had to have been just mind boggling for for these guys to be like doing this low budget indie film. It's their first feature. And yeah. James Kahn is sitting at the table with them. Yeah. I'm like, holy shit. Yeah. <laughs> like, um, and like, I don't know. I, I guess Wes Anderson, I don't know if he ever worked with James Kahn again. 
No, I don't think so. Yeah. Because he's not, he's not in the Royal Tenenbaums, is he? Mm-mm, I don't think so, no. No. Would have um, been would have been great to see. Um, yeah. But... Because obviously Wes Anderson is very famous for using the same people. Yeah. Um, yeah, and just kind of going back to that same well. Yeah. Um, do you feel like the the humor in this film like the thing that i kind of uh the thing that that was the closest to it to me in my mind was like napoleon dynamite for some reason yeah yeah but but it's still not quite the same as that um you know like when, when the film i think people just didn't get it when it first came out like they didn't understand the comedy yeah that's the only thing I can really, it's because it's not like, you know, you, we watch like Idiocracy and other kind of comedies, like 90s comedies, you know, it's not, I mean, Kindergarten Cop was like the 90s as well, you know, it's not that kind of, I don't know, like in your face comedy. It's, yeah. Maybe it's hard to pinpoint what kind of genre it is. Yeah, because it's not full comedy. It's not like a heist movie. It's not yeah. a you know outlaw movie. Really, it's not a romance movie. You know, it's all these elements kind of rolled into one. Yeah. Um, but it's the kind of movie that, like, if it got made today, it would be one of the greatest indie films of the year. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, the ambiguity that- and just the the kind of free flowing nature is what the indie film world is all about at the moment. Yeah. So, so. on on Rotten Tomatoes, like it, it's it's got a it had positive reviews from critics and stuff, you know, yeah. when it came out, it just didn't make a lot of money. Uh but the consensus on Rotten Tomatoes describes the film as Reservoir Dogs meets Breathless with a West Texas sensibility. Is that accurate? I feel like Reservoir Dogs and Breathless are two completely different serious. movies. Serious. Yeah, and too serious to be like in the same breath as this. You yeah, know, there's well, Breathless, of comedy, but Breathless does have a very nonchalant like Yeah. Uh just kind of like go with the flow kind of feel. Mm. It is a little more serious, yeah, in tone, but it's also just kind of like you know, let's see what yeah. happens, you know. Yeah. I mean, they do, like, it is more serious because they, I think, in Breathless, he, like, murders people right away, right? Yeah. If I'm remembering mm-hmm. correctly, doesn't mm-hmm. he, like, murder the cop or something? Yeah. Yeah, he shoots, doesn't he? I don't know if we see him. Uh, we do, I think. Yeah. Whereas, like, this, and and maybe they just put said Reservoir Dogs because it was the most. Tarantino-esque. Well, it, yeah. was, it was also a heist movie. You know, but yeah, yeah it, I don't feel like that's that's really accurate at all. It's like it, no. it. I feel like Wes Anderson created a new thing. You know, it's like it's it's easy for me to say, okay, Napoleon Dynamite is is kind of close to this, but you know, obviously this was way before that. Yeah. <clears throat> so, you know, maybe Napoleon Dynamite wouldn't exist without this kind of I film mean, probably getting not. popular. You know. Yeah, I mean, you look at the other film, well, the other comedy films that were out in 96, we've got Happy Gilmore, we've got Nutty, Profes- Nutty Professor, Beavis and Butthead Do America. Um, <laughs> you know, these, like, the films are very of a type, you know. Yeah. And the other kind of sleeper comedy is The Cable Guy, which didn't do very well when it was released, but has become, like, kind of a cool classic you know um space jam also it's light yeah i feel like uh wes anderson had a lot to do with uh taking film into a new era yeah Uh, yeah i think so i think he definitely i mean especially now it's easy to kind of look back on it now and be like this was the start but there's there's like a cool 
following with Wes Anderson. There's you know, mm-hmm. there's the diehards that he is the king of cinema. You yeah. know, he's their god. Um, yeah. and I think that he's he runs a fine line where he's mainstream, but if you like but the real film fanatics love him too. Yeah. Yeah. Um right now, which is it's hard to kind of come by really. I mean, to say yeah. that he's still out there just making his own movies and getting finance for them all, mm-hmm. you know, is pretty pretty amazing. Yeah. Cause I don't think there's many people that can do it on his level, you know, Noah Baumbach maybe, mm-hmm. but he's still you know, he's signed with Netflix and he's had some success, but he's not I wouldn't he's not Anderson's level in terms of popularity. Yeah. Right, yeah. Um But yeah, I think it like around this time there's a lot of people that were coming up and making a new type of comedy film. I mean, Baumbach is again the person that I think about when I see these films. Like it's the same comedy that we get in his films, I think. Yeah, because his first film, Kicking and Screaming, came out the same year, mm-hmm. I think. And uh yeah, there's actually a an interview or there's like a, a panel, you can find it on YouTube where the two of them are, are like having conversations together. Oh wow, that sounds which interesting. Which is cool. Yeah, he's yeah. like asking them questions and stuff and um yeah, it was it was cool. Um Yeah, it, it is I'm I'm excited to like I, I think I'm gonna follow the rabbit hole now of like Wes Anderson films because mm-hmm. I know the next film he made <clears throat> to also, it takes place in Texas, and he filmed it at his high school that he grew up Sweet. going to yeah. and stuff. Um, so I'm excited to see that. And and before you know, before I watched this film, I never knew that all these guys were from Texas. That kind of blows Neither my mind I. too, because yeah. like their their accents uh, to me don't really point them here. No, no, they don't. It's not. A Texas drawl. Yeah. Yeah, it's just kind of a a wow. <laughs> uh, speaking of which, I mean he's he says wow in this film is the first I mean obviously it's his first film, but you know. It's um, the first Wilson wow. Yeah. On camera. On in cinema. Wow. Um when not to paraphrase him, but when Anthony shows Dignan his sketchbook. He's like, wow. <laughs> um, yeah, like there's so there's so many, so, so many quotable lines in this film. Yeah. I mean, and, and that's probably part of the reason why I'm thinking of Napoleon Dynamite because it's just quote, like every line just so endlessly quotable. Um They'll never catch me because I'm fucking innocent. <laughs> <laughs> um, just like I want, like every few seconds, I was like, "Oh, that was funny. I should write that down." Oh, that was I funny. Know, I yeah. should write that down. What? Which part of Mexico are you from? Paraguay. <laughs> <laughs> Why is there tape on your nose? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I really like the. Um, th- with the tape on the nose, the scene where they're robbing the bookstore, uh-huh. um, and he's like, he's like, put the money in the bag. And he's like, show me some respect or something like that. And he's yeah, like, he's like, don't call me an idiot or something like yeah. that. Yeah, he's like, yeah. do you have any bigger bags, sir? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it's just like think- it's like perfectly in character. It's like it's not like yeah. you can tell they're acting. Yeah. Well, I think it just it like this film is more about becoming an adult than it is mm. like robbing banks. It's like yeah, you still have these big ideas of what you're gonna do and like where you want to go, um, but you're still figuring it out. Yeah, you know, and and those moments like that just brought it home. Like, you know, you still are a kid. You know, yeah. it's like I'm robbing. I'm robbing this bookstore. I'm doing it in a while, and it's like actually, I'm still got to respect my elders and you know my yeah. P's and Q's and stuff. Um, and then and like when Luke Wilson finds the guy that he's like he's like supposed to be taking hostage, and he's like, "What are you doing over here? You're supposed to be in the other section." Like, <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, 
I think the thing I laughed the most at was when uh, Owen Wilson is like, Bob stole his car. <laughs> <laughs> he like steals his own car. <laughs> um, yeah, that's an interesting, uh, interesting perspective. Like about about um, the the film is about like growing up and stuff because you can mm-hmm. see like times throughout the film where where the Luke Wilson character is kind of trying to get away from Dignan in yeah. some way. Not not really. I don't know because like it it's hard to to say if he's actually trying. Or not, but like there's obviously the whole hotel uh, stay when he falls in love with Inez and stuff, and that that kind of changes the character a bit, and uh, you see another side of him. Um, but then when they're, you know, he it it takes him a while to decide to do the final heist and stuff. Like he doesn't really want to do it, um, but he wants to be there for his friend, and then um. Yeah, I wanted to ask you, do you think that the characters change at all throughout the movie or at least by the end of it? And and I guess now that like with the perspective of, you know, it's about growing up, do they grow up by the end? Um, I definitely think that um, that Luke Wilson's character does. I think, you know, at the end where, uh, spoiler, Dignan is in prison and he's like, I found a way out. They're not going to shoot civilians. Um, mm. <laughs> like he for the first time he's not really going along with it you know because yeah. when we first see him he's like oh, I've got to pretend to break out of you know this um, this place even though it's like rehab right or like a voluntary mental institution I guess yeah something like that yeah yeah and he's like I've got to pretend to break out to like to appease him basically yeah, because he's got these big ideas and stuff. But whereas at the end, he's more like, I don't know about this. Yeah, you know? yeah. Because um, I didn't think he was going to change, especially like when Dignan comes back with the final heist, and he's like, "You got to get me one of those overalls," which is a really uh-huh. good scene. Yeah. Um, but he, I think, yeah, towards the end, he does. I think you know him and Bob are like <laughs> are the two that. <laughs> Are kind of gonna outgrow Dignan and and sadly I think leave him in prison. I guess I think you know they'll kind of grow up and move out and you know Dignan will be just left behind. Unfortunately, yeah, maybe he'll get out someday. He didn't kill yeah. anyone. He didn't. No, he did shoot the one of his own people, but <laughs> accidentally. <laughs> <laughs> um. Did you think they grew? I mean, I guess not really. You know, not yeah. much. You know, um, but I don't think it's really about that necessarily. No. I think I think it's is kind of more of a hangout kind of movie. Yeah. Like you just want to spend more time with these characters. Yeah, you know, I, this it, this reminded me when it ended of just like Luke Wilson's character maybe being like forty, forty five, and you know, someone mentions Dignan and he's like. Man, I've got a story to tell you. Like this one time, me and Dignan kind of, you know, wanted to be outlaws, and he's in jail now. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. this is this kind of like crazy story that just encapsulates being a young adult and not really being, you know, not wanting to go into the nine to five Monday to Friday world and not really seeing any way out. Yeah. You know? Um, kind of like Badlands. I know we talked about Badlands and how that displayed America. This was a, kind of similar for me. Mm. You know, just wanting to get out of the yeah. monotony. Yeah. Out of the system. Yeah. Because, yeah. I mean, he goes back into it, right? Like when like when he goes home after they've run out of money and stuff, he's like, yeah, I'm working like three jobs now and, mm. you know, yeah. I'm putting money aside and this is happening, this is happening. And th- then he goes back to the high school. He's like, yeah, this sucks. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, maybe it's just where I'm at mentally. I'm like, Ugh. yeah, I don't want to work nine to five for the rest of my life. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, there is, uh, there is also inter- like, uh, 
I don't know how this relates to our conversation necessarily, but I mean, the James Conn character, you know, you find out early on that he's, he's already, he's been in the heist business. He is a, he is a professional thief, you know, um, and obviously had a lot, a big influence on Dignan as a character. Um, and you know, I don't know if there's a deeper story there, a deeper meaning, but I mean, James Conn, like dupes all of them by getting yeah. them to to pull a heist and then he robs like the rich house like the guy's house well, yeah you know one of the guys that's involved in the heist while they're on the heist yeah um <laughs> <laughs> which is i mean it's it, again it's just like a throwaway line yeah you know, he, he robbed bob's house while we were <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> you know yeah and then dignan's like oh, i thought about doing that <laughs> you know, but I mean, maybe that's what he does when he gets out of prison is like he's he becomes the James Caan guy because, yeah. you know, J- like in the film, he's he's a professional thief. Yeah, but he's also still kind of like goofy and weird and and a little uh, off, I guess, kind of yeah. like digging yeah. in some ways, you know. Yeah, Um. he's got like I had to like pause and zoom in. But like, there's like a scene where he's sitting on a couch talking with someone, and he has a ponytail. Oh, oh, just like a little one. Yeah, just like a little, yeah. you know, <laughs> yeah. just like a little, like, uh, like uh, the last Airbender kind of yeah. ponytail. Top, yeah. Um. It, yeah, it was weird. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, I also really love the production design in the film like Mm -hmm. you know that that's the a lot of the Wes Anderson style that you can see I mean also with the camera work which apparently he's had the same cinematographer you know I mean this launched his career and they've they worked together and you know even though it's not quite as um recognizable maybe just to the average person as the rest of his films like usually all of his films are about like symmetry instead of asymmetry that makes sense yeah. everything is like centered and perfect instead of like off to the side um yeah. and this film has a lot of those like those kind of shots you know like there's yeah. there's the shot of um the party towards the end of the film when James Conn is sitting on that couch and you know um, there's like the scene with Luke Wilson character and, um, and as, uh, played by, what is her name? Lumi, uh, Cavazos, Cavazos, Lumi Cavazos. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, when they're like falling in love and they're in the pool and they're like under the diving board, it, they're like in the center of the frame. Mm-hmm. Um, just things like that. Like he was just thinking in a different way. Yeah. You know what I mean? The way that yeah. Wes Anderson sees films and sees cinema, I feel it's just, it was just unique right out of the gate. And he's just stayed true yeah. to himself the whole time somehow. Mm-hmm. I mean, that, that's his style. I mean, that's, you know, probably something that just resonates with him. Um, yeah. And you can see, throughout his career. Yeah, I think that it's very assured to say it's a first feature. Yeah. You know, there's not there's not really a break from the Wes Anderson-ness of it, if that makes sense. It's very there's not, you know, like a like a massive like crane shot at any point. There's no right. you know, like fast moving camera work. It's all very as you said, like Wes Anderson y. Mm-hmm. Um and that's you know that's amazing. He didn't really take that much time to find his feet, which yeah. I know was what you were saying. But yeah, yeah, it's um, it's crazy. And I think the reason that this film um, probably isn't as talked about is it's even though it is Wes Anderson, it's dialed back. Mm. Yeah, you know, it's not the colors and the and it. You know, it's still these characters still feel real. Whereas I feel yeah. like the, the later we go in the, in the Wes Anderson universe, they start to feel more and more like cartoons. Right. You know? Um, and I think compared to his other ones, it is a little bit more reserved. 
for obvious reasons. You know, probably yeah. didn't have the budget, but yeah. Um, yeah, it's it really surprised me that it's not highly like higher rated. You know? Yeah, I mean, it is it is uh in the Criterion Collection. It is, yeah. You know, yeah. Um, I think most of them are though, right? I think. Oh really? All of his films are potentially. Wow. wow. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Um, potentially, yeah. So that's pretty cool. It is, yeah. I think um, definitely, you know, gonna like you said, I'm gonna try and check some out. I want to watch Rushmore and yeah, um, Life Aquatic and stuff like that. So. Yeah, yeah. There's still a lot that I haven't seen. Yeah. Um, for real. Yeah. So, also, you know, Martin Scorsese said mm. that this was one of his top. 10 favorite films of the 1990s. Is Scorsese saying it? Like, it's going to be good. Yeah, exactly. I don't think I've disagreed with his verdict once, Sam. (laughs) He said uh, he praised Wes Anderson for his ability to convey the simple joys and interactions between people so well with such richness. I mean, yeah. I mean, this is what I was going to say. A little bit like the the reason that Dignan worked so well for me is why I enjoyed it so much was I feel like I had a friend like Dignan when I was younger. Yeah. Um, who wasn't as, I don't know. I don't know the right word to say, but what wasn't, you know, on the same level with me and my friends. Yeah. You know, he was still part of our like friendship group and stuff. Um, and as we've grown up and kind of got married and moved out and stuff like that, he's kind of stayed in the same place. Yeah. And I saw a lot of him indignant. Yeah. You know, and I think that that's why it felt so real because I'd had kind of these conversations with him in the past. Yeah. You know, where he's just, he wants to do something that's just too ridiculous. Yeah. And you're like, okay, we can do it. Like, if you want to do it, let's do it, you know, but we never robbed anywhere, obviously, but, (laughs) um, (laughs) you know, and I can remember when I passed my driving test, he was like, he wanted me to teach him what I was doing because he was he was just so excited about it, and he still hasn't taken any lessons. Oh wow! You know, yeah, he's just it's hard to explain, but I think yeah. Dignan is him, mm. which is just crazy. Yeah, but cool. I mean, it's yeah, it's uh, yeah. I mean, it's a sign of a good film when you can project onto it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know, yeah. I wonder whether I. I mean, I want to see the short that they made to just see where the idea came from. Yeah, it's on YouTube. I mean, it's. I did watch it. It's mostly. I mean the the short film is pretty much the beginning of of the feature. Okay. Uh, it's interesting because they do they do like the bookstore robbery, but they don't show it. Okay. <laughs> like he knocks on the door and then it cuts mm-hmm. and it's after the robbery and then they're just sitting outside a gas station and they're talking about what just happened. Wow. And they're like, yeah, when well, the you did that and then he did yeah. that, that was hilarious. And it's like all the stuff that happens in the feature, but they didn't shoot it in the short. Yeah. And did they, like, did the characters feel the same? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. They're, yeah. they're a little more fleshed out and lived in by the mm-hmm. time they get to yeah. the feature. Um, but yeah, they did, they did feel, I mean, pretty much the same. Yeah. I wonder if the, like the characters grew from their performances in the short or whether they were written like that. Do you know what I mean? Mm, Yeah. If like Owen Wilson was like, I'm going to play him like this. Yeah. I mean, probably because Owen Wilson also wrote this film with Wes Anderson. Yeah. Well then, yeah, definitely. (laughs) Yeah. Um, and yeah. then I think he also wrote with him on Royal Tenenbaums, and then oh, that's yeah. the last thing that Owen Wilson kind of wrote. Mm. Um, which you know is interesting because I feel like I I don't I don't know how much you know how much he wrote of those films, but they're I mean they're both great films. It it makes me wonder what kind of career. I mean, he's had a good career, you know, but yeah. what, what kind of yeah. career he would have had if he wrote more of his own material. You yeah. Know? 
I mean, Ben yeah. Stiller like writes and directs and acts in all of his own films, you know. Um, mm. I mean, yeah, I just looked on IMDb really quick, and his four writing credits are the short bottle rocket, the the feature bottle rocket, Rushmore, and then the Royal Tenenbaums. Yeah, and that's it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I mean, I know. I know Owen Wilson has popped up in a few. I mean, I I I've, I've got to dive more into all of Wes Anderson's films, so I don't know how yeah. how much Owen like uh, Owen Wilson and Luke Wilson both collaborated with him after that. Mm-hmm. But it seems like, at least more recently, they don't they don't all work together. I mean, they're probably yeah. all still friends and stuff, but I mean, Luke Wilson isn't doing much right now he's doing a lot more tv isn't he i think okay i think owen wilson's been in the majority of the films i mean yeah he was in darjeeling limited yeah Yeah. and like i said he's he's pretty much he he's not dignan but he's 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 got the same kind of vibe like i said where he's like very much in his own world and trying to get people on his level yeah yeah um, but yeah, yeah. Anything? I think it, I mean overall it was a very enjoyable watch. Oh yeah, you know, it, I mean it's it's I, it's yeah, a film fun. I think I'll watch again, and I think yeah. uh, you know it's it's something that's that's probably fun to watch with a group of people. You know, mm-hmm. fun fun to watch if you. It's like a hangout movie, like I said. Like yeah. it's um not hard to follow. And just funny, quotable line yeah. after line after line. It's true. So, have a pizza party. Throw a bottle rocket on. Yeah. Get some fireworks. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so let's, uh, let's guess what we rated the film, unless you have something else. That is all I've got. So okay. let's... Yeah. yeah, so let's rate. Um, I think you gave it four and a half. Okay. I think you gave it four. You are correct, sir. I did give it four. You are correct, sir. No, I go. did give it four and a half. We're this is just so it. easy now. <laughs> yeah. I mean, maybe yeah. I say that, and then next week we're like way off. <laughs> <laughs> um, speaking of next week... Do you know what we're watching? I don't. Surprise, surprise, Brendan. Do you know what we're watching? I don't. Does Are... anyone know what we're watching? Yes. We have Ew. a special guest <laughs> coming on next week. Uh, we're going to start doing a, a new little ditty mm. on the show on the first Sunday of every month. Yeah. Lord willing. Film God willing. <laughs> uh, yeah, where we have a special guest and they pick the film. Yeah. And make us watch it. <laughs> Force us to, like in a clockwork orange. <laughs> yeah, that's um, right. And then we have to discuss, dissect, and uh, talk about it. So yeah. I'm going to now turn it over to our special guest who's going to reveal what the film is. Well, hello there, hello there. My name is Jason Woods, filmmaker, director, cinematographer, whatever. And the film that I've chosen for D2 to watch along with me is Dogma by none other than Kevin Smith. The reason I chose this is because it's kind of a hard find. And I feel like is one of his smartest works and I want more people to you know to experience that so I can't wait to see everyone so have a nice day wow I cannot <laughs> wait to watch that that sounds amazing thank That's you gonna so be much a lot special of fun. guest yes thank you <laughs> <laughs> uh, ladies and gentlemen that brings us to the end of the show of course, you can find us on Twitter, Instagram, all of the social medias at Film Church Radio, 
Or you can follow us individually on Letterboxd. I am at Selma Scope, and Lewis is at Walker Lewis 3007 There you can keep up with what we've been watching uh, and what we rate things and what's on our watch list and what we have or have not seen. Uh, you, we also have all of our back episodes streaming on all good podcast platforms. Please leave us a rating and review. And uh, let us know if you like the film this week and what you would like for us to watch in the future. Lewis, you're like paper, you know? Like trash. Like trash? You're like paper flowing by, you know? I mean, it doesn't sound that bad in Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> this is the quote that I had to write down as soon as I heard it. <laughs> <laughs> Literally just everything in this film. Yeah. So quotable. <sighs> All right, folks. We'll see you next Sunday. Have a good week. Say your prayers. Film church prayers. (laughs) A A. (laughs) Amen. Amen. (laughs) Praise be to the film gods. Oh.